have they been lying to you about when the SEC lawsuit with Ripple will finally come to an end through a settlement? Well, many people have been banking on the fact that the lawsuit between Ripple and the SEC would have concluded or in the very least reached a settlement by the end of this month in July. But is that a lie? Well, pro XRP lawyer and advocate Fred Raspoli shared that the lawsuit had a high likelihood of concluding whether it was July 13th or by July 31st at the latest. This led many people on social media to jump on board the bandwagon, spreading the hopium as far as social media goes. Right here, you can see that Jeremy said final judgment in July. If you scroll a bit more, you can see that we're looking at a May 6th uh, deal, or after that, wait till July. Uh, right here, you can see 25th, new SEC meeting. That's likely to be the settlement period, then by July 26th. So across the board, people have been hoping for an end to this very long, dark cloud that's been hanging over Ripple and XRP. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm all for the hope, but it is tough when there's already so much anticipation for a conclusion after this long four-year process that's arguably suppressed the price of XRP. And with all of the social media speculation that it was going to happen this month, someone like Pauly even said that a guy named Bitlord just gave him a date and he was willing to put $100,000 on the case getting a settlement. But as July comes to a close, it's looking more and more like that's actually not going to happen. So in this video, we're going to address the settlement rumors and the more likely outcome for XRP. We'll be covering what Brad Garlinghouse has to say about the rumors and a potential settlement. And we'll even be diving into a new video that recently came out from CNBC from the prior head of the SEC alongside the sketchy history surrounding his resignation, which seems like a major conflict of interest. So what's next for Ripple and how will this affect your XRP and crypto bags? We'll discuss all of the above and even dive into the technicals behind the token itself. And also while you're here, we have a really exciting announcement that we are going to be delivering at the end of the week surrounding the number one play to earn XRP game. And it's actually the first of its kind. So this is gonna be a great way for everyone inside of this community to stack to those XRP bags uh, and get ready for a major bull run. So if you're feeling blessed, comment 777. If you're feeling bullish, comment 777. And if you're gonna be the wealthiest person in your family tree, smash the subscribe button. Before we dive in, a quick reminder that the opinions in this video are for informational and educational purposes only and do not constitute financial, legal, or investment advice. All investments, including cryptos, carry risks and potential losses. Always do your own research and consult with a licensed financial advisor. We are not licensed financial advisors and relying on our content for financial decisions is at your own risk. By watching this video, you agree we are not responsible for any losses or damages and we do not guarantee any specific results or outcomes. Some of the links below may be affiliate links and we may earn a commission, which actually helps support this channel and helps us to create value based videos like this. We also hold some positions in the cryptocurrencies that we talk about, but that's only because we do what we believe in. However, this should not be interpreted as a recommendation for you to do the same. With that said, let's get into the video. Everyone always talks about Gary Gensler and his tyrannical crusade to destroy crypto markets. Very few people ever talk about this guy. Who is Jay Clayton? Well, many could argue that the XRP lawsuit actually all started with this guy right here, and the work was to be carried out by Gary Gensler. Now, what's super interesting and odd, as we go over to the sec.gov newsroom, you can see here that on December 22nd of 2020, the SEC charges Ripple and two executives with conducting a $1.3 billion unregistered securities 
offering. Now we already know the outcome of that situation, right? Ripple itself was not deemed a security, but instead a commodity. And so it's just been a long back and forth where finally Ripple was able to come out not only alive after millions of dollars spent on this lawsuit, but the SEC retroactively was charging people with offering unregistered securities without having any clear rules or guidelines for companies in the crypto space. So it seemed kind of unfair. But what I'm really after is this date right here, December 22nd of 2020. Then we're gonna come over to Jay Clayton and look at his tenure. And you can see here Clayton resigned on December 23rd, literally the day after he started the lawsuit, which you could argue, okay, maybe that's coincidental, whatever the case may be. One of his final actions and on his last day at the SEC before resigning was to sue Ripple Labs challenging the legality of trading cryptocurrency, XRP, as an unregistered security. Now, if you were to ask anyone in Washington Typically, when someone's about to leave their post, uh, maybe, you know, there was a new election, uh, someone else is going to be stepping in. Uh, they're typically not creating new problems within the last month and arguably the last week and day. Uh, more often than not, they're cleaning out office, they're sending goodbye notes, they're taking care of business in order to move on to that next period of their life. Uh, they're not starting a lawsuit for a $1.3 billion unregistered securities type deal, which is, again, just it, it seems fairly odd that that would be the last thing he does on the last day in office only for a new person to come in now we're going to discuss some of the weird stuff surrounding this case here uh, but first we're going to watch a video from cnbc the chair is generally designated is designated by the president and the chair typically switches when there's a switch in administration and in some cases, uh, in fact, in the case of my tenure and in the case of my predecessor, um, knowing that there was a switch in, in administration and knowing that the chair would change, um, the, the existing chair, the current chair, um, takes their leave and moves on. Hmm. So, look, this is entirely up to Chair Gensler as to what he would want to do in that event. But there's precedent for um, leaving the position altogether or simply leaving the position as chair. Under, and just to clarify on that, can the president take away the chairmanship and just have some? Right. I, that I is see. Correct. So maybe he yeah, remains he, he, commissioner, but not the chair. Now, it's funny how he shares his opinion on the case surrounding Gary Gensler saying, well, typically when you're appointed by, by a president uh, during their administration, you would hold that position and then you would typically leave after your tenure. So that would make sense. In other words, he sounds like he's just protecting the role of SEC chair and arguably Gary Gensler uh, in order for him to save face. But it's obvious and it's no secret that Donald Trump shared this news at Bitcoin Nashville. And so Gary is probably either trembling in his seat. Now, what's really interesting is in that role of government, they actually are positioned for five years. So their job has a tenure of five years. It usually rolls over into the next presidency. Uh, I started looking into the history surrounding the SEC, and we'll dive a little bit more into that in a second. Uh, it's been around since 1934. We've had plenty of chairmen of the SEC. Uh, more often than not, they serve out their entire entire period or their tenure. Uh, and then, you know, a quarter to uh, likely less than half of the time, they resign, whether the job's too hard, whether they get a lot of political backlash, whatever. Uh, in the case of the previous chair, Jay Clayton, he did resign and it was really odd how he did a day before. Well, now he's speculating, well, you know, Gary Gensler will probably leave his post because of new incoming administration. But in all reality, it's because of what Donald Trump said here. Oh, on day one, I will fire Gary Gensler and appoint a new SEC chairman. I didn't know he was that unpopular. He's so unpopular. That was the biggest applause he got. It honestly gives me chills just listening to that because it is a very exciting announcement for the entire world of crypto. For not only Bitcoin, which this is what the conference was about, but for companies like Coinbase and Ripple and virtually every other crypto in the entire space.
Wow. I didn't know he was that unpopular. Let me say it again. On day one, I will fire Gary Gensler. Whoa. And honestly, that's music to my ears. It's music to the ears of Brad Garlinghouse over at Ripple and everyone inside of the XRP community. Now, here is the list of Securities and Exchange Commission chairman throughout history. We go back all the way to 1934. And if I just scroll here, you're going to see all of these names and the different presidents that they served under. Some people had about a one year tenure. Other people uh, had multiple years or served their entire tenure. Over here, you could see that sometimes we were vacant. But across the board, right, uh, we had a lot of commissioners. Now here in commissioners and chairman. Now here's what's really, really interesting. Jay Clayton is the only person in history to file a major lawsuit not only the day before not only the week before or the month before right but he's the only person to do it literally right before he left office and then in comes Gary Gensler and you could argue maybe there was a political reason there maybe they hated crypto so much they said we need someone else who's going to stand up to it and we need you out Jay Clayton that said the only other person that comes even remotely close is Harvey Pitt. But even the Harvey Pitt issue, when he sued WorldCom, the SEC filed civil fraud charges against WorldCom on June 26th. Pitt abruptly resigned from the SEC under pressure after the polls closed on election night, November 5th. So this was actually months apart. Uh, and he had a lot of issues and a lot of political uh, stuff going on and people really didn't like him. He wasn't that popular. He was also around during the time of Enron. He was a little too close to all of these accounting companies. So anyone could see why there was issues there. But that said, uh, not even one of these guys had a, you know, a day before lawsuit. It was was months before and arguably because of a different issue, not the WorldCom SEC lawsuit. Now, what's interesting is if you go back to Jay Clayton's Wikipedia page, you can see that after his tenure, right, it mentions a few different names. In February of 2021, Apollo Global Management appointed Clayton to the newly created role of lead independent director. Clayton also rejoined, uh, you know, probably a law firm here, Sullivan and Cromwell. It is the most law firm name I've ever heard, uh, where he was a partner before entering government. Okay, but they don't mention anything around different relationships partnerships or advisory roles and so I did a bit of digging which is really interesting and what we found was that he was a uh, let's see here uh, what did they call him and it, he, he joined the advisory council over at one river digital asset management they welcomed him Jay Clayton now, what makes it even more interesting and weird is that One River Asset Management states this, but here's the reality, okay? They are a crypto management firm. Alternative investments for a changing world is how they promote it. And they basically talk about the risks of inflation and change in the world and technologies and why they should manage your money. And you can go ahead and go to OneRiverAM.com to check it out for yourself. But here's what's interesting. I actually had to double verify exactly how are they managing it who's on the team what are they doing and then I had to go and double verify it with chat GPT and here's what it said Clayton's resignation came as a part of a planned departure is what he called it following the 2020 presidential election and amid crisis and scrutiny regarding his handling of cryptocurrency regulation so there was already a lot of scrutiny around attacking one of the most important and key players in the entire crypto world at the time and the potential and here's the key point potential conflicts of interest so what are those conflict of interest Jay Clayton joined One River Asset Management as an advisor. As of now, there is no publicly available information, and I haven't found it. I did look, uh, indicating that Jay Clayton has left his advisory role over at One River Asset Management. The firm continues to focus on digital assets, including investments in Bitcoin 
and Ethereum. So why did he play so unfair the day before he left, handed over to Gary Gensler, almost like there were talks happening behind closed doors. And that's just my assumption, complete speculation, but it's the only time in history that has ever happened. Uh, and then he's playing ball and being friendly with Bitcoiners and Ethereum, so on and so forth. And then he went on to say this, that he was confident uh, that the SEC would approve uh, an Ethereum ETF. There's two pieces of approval for one of these types of products. There's the listing approval, which is what happened on May 23rd, and then there's the approval of the product itself, which we just experienced already. Uh, the Ethereum ETF is currently live and trading, which is still pending. That's called the re registration statement. That's what we need to find out. But he said it's basically inevitable uh, and that it's going to happen. This is where he says it's inevitable. So that said, it seems to me that there were levels uh, in terms of conflict of interest for him to immediately resign after creating a major lawsuit with a major crypto player, calling them a security. But then, right, it one that, you know, we finally determined after many millions of dollars in time later that it's not a security, uh, only to go work with a firm specifically pertaining to Bitcoin and Ethereum. So I'll let you do what you will for with that information and make up your own mind. But at the end of the day, it doesn't seem like anyone's really played fair in any case across the board. Uh, you know, so far, so many people have been expecting an end to this ordeal at the end of July and the end of July has rolled around and we have not heard word. So when are we likely to see the end of this deal and the settlement? Here's what Brad Garlinghouse has to say. Proving Brad is that, is that a fair take? I mean, at least from a regulatory perspective, XRP is now backlisted on Coinbase and trading. That's good news. Um, but it's not 100% maybe where the industry would need it or want it to be. Yeah. I mean, look, I think as you reflect on the last handful of years, we'll call it four or five years, there are things that are super frustrating. You know, why did the SEC go after XRP kind of first, if you will? There, uh you know, in some ways, you look at that now and you say, we're almost at the very, very end of that journey. I think that, you know, hopefully we have resolution. Uh, we, we can't control that now. The judge, you know, will make the decision when she makes the decision. I, my estimation is sometimes in sometime before the end of the summer, somebody asked me, is that the end of August? I pointed out <laughs> that September 21st is the end of summer. So I don't know, sometime there. I think my birthday, August 28th, that's the end of but summer. You know what? If I'll ask her if we can celebrate your birthday with that. That would be, yeah. we'll all celebrate with you. We'll call the judge. So as you can see, right, he's actually hoping for the end to this ordeal sometime probably at the end of August into September. There have been people that have stated that there will potentially be appeals which could push this thing as far back as 2026. And I just don't see that realistically happening with Gary Gensler 100% likely to lose his post under a Donald Trump presidency. But even if the Donald Trump, for whatever reason, were to lose the election, I still don't see a situation where Gary Gensler and the SEC would have any real backing or any type of foundation to continue uh, moving this lawsuit forward when now you already have uh, an Ethereum ETF and a lot of candidates, uh, whether they're Democrat or Republican, being pro-crypto. It's going to make him look very bad, his tenure look very bad, uh, and he'll have to resign uh, ashamed, which, you know, uh, no one really wants to do that, uh, but it's the likely outcome. So uh, we do expect this thing to end closer to the end of August, maybe into September. If they do appeal, I would be shocked, but you never know. That's the reality, and that's the world we live in. We have to wait on a judge. Now with that covered, whatever you may believe about the case and arguably this interesting guy by the name of Jay Clayton, I would argue that he does have a finger on the pulse of the potential outcomes uh, in the future when it comes to regulatory oversight and crypto and most importantly, stable coins. Uh, and so there is some positive news in all of this. Uh, and here's what he has to share. Right, Chairman, retrospectively about the way in which the SEC has handled the emergence of crypto, uh, crypto as an asset class. Well, look, please, please call me Jay. And, and Surat had this exactly right. One of the fascinating things about crypto 
is that it came not through the institutional markets where most of the financial product development takes place. Most of the financial product development in the globe takes place in the US in our institutional markets. Crypto, digital assets, really came globally and at the retail level. So the development was something very new for, I would say, regulators across the globe in the way that it, in the way that it came about. And there have been a lot of old lessons relearned and new lessons learned. You know, one of the one of the old lessons relearned and, and and learned in a tough way was that when you raise money from the general public in America, that's an incredibly rigorously regulated transaction. We we protect the public from securities offerings in an incredibly rigorous way. Mm -hmm. And this was this was the ICO craze and the like. And right. you know, I think that those regulations have have been shown. Um, on the other side. What I think regulators have had to learn is that this technology could be, and it's in many ways has become a step change for existing processes and some new processes, including what I would say is the rise of stablecoin, which is one of the more remarkable developments in finance um, in the last decade. And so it's really good news to hear it coming from a former SEC chair's mouth that they seem to want to play friendly with stable coins. There was a period of time there, especially with USDT, not really showing their proof of reserves and coming from Bitfinex and just, you know, some sketchy things that were happening there that they didn't have the proper liquidity uh, and they were too fractionalized, so on and so forth, uh, that, you know, people were worried about it completely collapsing or there to be a major lawsuit only for the entire crypto market to suffer. But at this stage in the game, it seems to be making not only a comeback but a real dent in the market and so now right we have the news around ripple issuing a usd backed stable coin uh and here's what it, the article directly from ripple says this is a natural step for ripple to continue bridging the gap between traditional finance and crypto said brad garlinghouse ripple ceo institutions entering this space are finding success by partnering with compliant crypto native players and ripples track record and resiliency speaks for itself you know that's the reality i think if there's one key word that we can really latch onto here it's resiliency virtually nobody comes out alive after a major sec lawsuit especially if you're a young and budding industry uh and so far ripple has stood the test of time and their token has not got sold off into oblivion but it's developed a a really strong support so much so that some folks call it a stable coin even though that's not the case they will actually issue their own stable coin and the real benefits of that stable coin would include uh, the fact that it's enterprise grade, right? You can actually specialize it for uh, financial institutions and their needs. It's compliance first mindset. We found that out the hard way. You don't want another issue with any regulators. Uh, they are going to provide liquidity on DEXs. And there's a lot of really cool things you can do with decentralized exchanges that are just not possible in the traditional financial world. Uh, I'm, you know, Know, a testament to that there were times where if i wanted access to capital quickly i could get it and i didn't have to go through an intermediary i didn't need permission there's no such thing as a credit check you just provide collateral and you're able to get it uh super beautiful and the reality is they they do it for just about anyone because it is truly decentralized they don't look at an id they don't look at anything other than the fact that do you have the collateral it's going to be staked in this protocol and if you hit uh you don't have your you know reserve requirements or your collateral becomes uh too cheap right we're going to liquidate the position now i'm starting to get into the weeds there uh but there's some really cool things you can do with dexes and when banks start to catch on to that and institutional players you'd be shocked at just how fast they're going to adopt it. They have, uh, they're gonna be completely transparent and I would argue they have to be now at the stage they're in. They're under constant scrutiny. And then finally, finally there's gonna be multi-chain compatibility, whether it's with Ethereum, whether it's probably in the future with Cosmos Atom, Solana, XRP, eventually Bitcoin layer twos, everything under the sun is possible and potential with a stable coin. So that said, the future seems to be very bright for XRP. Let's dive into the charts just for the last portion of this call. 
or the, the video, I should say. So if you've been on the channel for a while, you're no stranger to the XRP chart. Uh, it's most recent high off of that July 13th outcome with the SEC. Uh, and that really kind of marks the local top for over a year. Since then, we've been in a very strong range, uh, arguably between 45 cents up to 75 cents. So about a 30 cent range. Uh, and that's a year long range so uh, whenever you get a lot of sideways price action and um, develop a strong support and resistance whenever you get a breakdown okay below that range only to watch the price break right back in this is typically what you would call a bear trap people are bearish here they start to short only to get trapped into their position and arguably probably liquidated somewhere above this range right here and as you can see here not only do we have a fat wick right there people were probably liquidated but then the price continued climbing right because they have to sell those positions in order to cover now that said uh, this was our previous resistance right here not only did we break out above it but we were recently supported there price is looking really strong when I pull up a few EMAs and we're gonna keep it basic guys you know sometimes I'm telling you there's so many I after having done this for close to I'm doing the math here since 2016 and seen it all. I've used every single possible indicator. You come and look at the amount of indicators that I've favorited. You look at the amount of indicators that I've went ahead and created. Okay, you look at all of the different opportunities and possibilities and you can start to really toss a bunch of things on your chart. But ultimately, right, uh, you can find it whatever you really want out of the market. And so what I found is people use indicators to confirm uh, their ideas and arguably uh, if you have too many on there it's either going to confuse you and keep you from action uh, or it's going to confirm your idea and guess what in markets you can still be wrong with all of the right information so it's it's really important more than anything we practice good risk management and that you take opportunities where you see them but ultimately I guess my point is it's better to keep things simple on charts sometimes horizontal supports and resistances a good time frame with the good EMA and then just conviction in the play with good risk management that said okay we have broke out and started a new trend this would have been our downtrend okay a series of lower lows and lower highs so let me just go ahead and mark those let me grab this tool here this was our major high for the range this was our next low our next high came in somewhere right around in these guys but really right around here and then another breakdown here so this was a downtrend we got a series of lower lows and lower highs then what happened if we broke out above this range right here we would have officially created a new uptrend and so wherever we get support as long as we continue to make new highs and new higher lows we should be fine so let me go ahead now and remove those drawings and keep it very straightforward and simple this was the price to beat we beat it okay now the next major range is going to be here what i do love and where i'm finding some good confirmations is one we're being supported consistently at that 10 ema over a period of i don't know let's look about two weeks okay and finally we're getting back to the previous range high of 62 to 64 cents so if we break above here it's highly likely we're pumping right up to 75 cents and on any major announcement or news from the team especially involving a settlement or a major bitcoin breakout things are likely to moon because this is not only the range to beat but guess what it is basically the multi-year range before we start to see some price action at two 133 to $2. So uh, anything into the 75 cent range, I would watch very closely if we bust right through it with some support, you know, with some strength uh, and strong volume, that's a good indicator. Another really strong indicator that I like to look at, okay, is volume. So the first thing I like to look at, let me go ahead and make that clear. Okay, uh, right into this breakout, you can see that we had increasing and rising volume. That is good and indicative of a strong trend. So volume is there to confirm the move and trend. Whenever you start to get, uh, you know, dropping or declining volume as the price continues to climb back up to that previous all-time high. So you'll notice right here, right, uh, we have volume 
declining right here, yet the price is climbing back to this previous range high. If we get a breakout right here at the 63 cent level on any daily time frame at least, okay, you should see the green volume bars start to pick up again and increase and pretty soon into a new high, probably up to like the 75 cent range minimum, you're going to see bigger volume candles than you saw back here that are green. And so the volume Volume is confirming the move. It's telling you money is behind this price action because sometimes you'll get a breakout, but you see volume is really weak. And so that's an indicator that it might be a trap. Okay. And the next thing I would mention is that the stochastic RSI has now, since this local high over here, officially turned up, right? The fast moving is above the slow moving and we're light and we're at a local low. And so now we're likely to come right back up to this range into a breakout. So not only do we get the early signal here, volume is looking really good, the price action is looking strong, we're getting support. And then to compound that, on the sell off today, okay, we're seeing higher highs on the wick and this sell off was caused uh, by the US government moving Bitcoin from wallet to wallet. There's speculation around they're gonna sell or something. I would argue the fact that that happened and the price didn't dump harder is a good indicator that there's real strength in this market right now. And so what I'm really after is buying dips. And the major reason I would say I'm after buying dips is because I have an indicator here called hash ribbons. And more often than not, this thing has been absolutely right. It is based on uh, mining okay and the hash rate but into bull markets what's really really interesting is whenever we see that buy signal right you either remain flat or in the capitulation signal into the buy signal you actually break out for some major moves we also saw it right here buy signal major move right uh into the bull market right here well this was the only time that we didn't see that uh but i think this was actually our technical bottom until we had the ftx scandal which really caused a lot of fear in the market um, and so there was a massive capitulation and removal of Bitcoin from exchanges. But right here and here would have been a stupid good time to buy after the capitulation phase into the buy phase. And this is really weird. It's based on the hash rate, but it seems to work really well in bull markets. And yet again, recently we experienced another buy signal after a long period of capitulation. So I would argue if Bitcoin breaks out, XRP price action is actually looking better and stronger right now. Uh, it's highly likely we're going up to that 75 cent range soon. And any breakdown on a serious time frame below that 20 EMA uh, would on a daily time frame would get me a little bit worried that we could potentially go lower and that this could be the next major high in a downtrend. But I don't think that is the potential or likely outcome. That is my opinion. My opinion is we are going higher, but I do want to practice good risk management. I don't want to be stuck in a market where anything can happen and now we're ranging for another year. Okay. At the end of the day, it is all about good risk management, planning, preparation, recognizing patterns uh, and ultimately having fun while you're doing it. So if you enjoyed the video, thanks so much for watching. Uh, go ahead and go to the description below bullrunners.com to discover how to earn more crypto in less than 10 minutes per day with the number one, the very first XRP play to earn game. Uh, appreciate you guys watching. Uh, smash the subscribe button. Leave us a comment below for what you think is going to happen in the upcoming months. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.